This Holy Week I wanted to offer you a gift, again I can't celebrate the liturgies of the Passion, Holy Thursday, Easter with you, but I wanted to give you the gift of tying together the Shroud of Turin and what it says about Jesus, and I wanted to tie together the timeline so we can go through the different phases of Holy Thursday, through the Passion, using the Shroud of Turin as a guideline for what Jesus went through. The Shroud of Turin, what starts on it, begins at about 9 p.m. on Holy Thursday. According to the Gospels, which will also be referenced below, as well as an explanation about the Shroud of Turin, Jesus began the Last Supper about the ordinary time, which would have been about 6 p.m. And about evening when it's dark, he heads out, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. He was used to going there, that's where Judas was able to figure out where he was since he was no longer at the place of the Last Supper. He is there praying, Father, not my will, but thine be done, praying in great anguish. And there will be three times that he goes back to the disciples. And he says, can you not stay just one hour with me? So we're allowed to calculate that from about 9 p.m. till 12 p.m., Jesus is in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. During this time of prayer, his sweat, his fear grows and grows so intense that he sweats blood, according to the account of Luke. That is actually medically possible, that through fear, the heart beats so much that the capillaries around the skin, they burst, and blood, as well as sweat, comes out from all of the little sweat pores that Jesus would have had. If that's the case, as the Shroud of Turin has basically blood all over the image, it's tiny drops are all across wherever the body was placed. If that's the case, then every single contact Jesus suffered, for example, 12 p.m., Judas's kiss, he would have felt it at 10 times the normal strength. So the passion that Jesus is about to go through is not just the passion and suffering that would already be brutal and horrible, but one felt at 10 times the intensity. At 12 a.m. he's betrayed, we can imagine he's led roughly towards the house of the high priest. Annas and Caiaphas had a house in the same area with a patio adjoining them. It was necessary to try a suspect twice according to Jewish law. It was actually supposed to be done on two separate days, but they were doing things in a hurry to get Jesus dead before the Passover. So he's tried, first of all, at Annas' house at 1 a.m. Uh, based on the Gospel of John. Now, when he refuses to uh, respond to Annas and Caiaphas and say, ask those who heard me, he is hit across the face. The word in Greek actually comes from the word for stick. So it's not just a punch, which would have already been bullying someone who's tied up and chained and is surrounded by enemies. He's hit across the face with a stick. The Shroud of Turin implies that his nose was bent, maybe even broken. We can assume that although the prophecy said that not a bone would be broken of Jesus, that's why his legs are not broken at the end of the Passion, the nose is cartilage. It can be smashed. And then after that, the Gospels record that while Jesus is held between the two trials, the guards cover his face with a cloth and then hit him and say, prophesy, who was it that struck you? It's hard enough to be bullied and beaten, but to be covered, to be blinded with a cloth and then have someone hit you, you can't see if the punch is coming or not. You can't see when another one will come. Jesus goes through this torment. What I have placed here on the image is a sculpture which attempts to take the blood and the patterns from the Shroud of Turin and show us what Jesus' face would have been like. It would also seem that the right eye would have been closing because of basically a huge black eye. You'll notice that in the rest of the Passion, Jesus is much more silent, but when the man hits him with a stick, it's the one time he asks, why did you strike me? It was a great blow, would have knocked him probably to the ground. Now, at 6 a.m., it says at daybreak, so the sun is just rising, that would have been about 5.50 in the morning on Friday, according to Jerusalem, they're having the second trial in Caiaphas. Now, they already want to kill him. 
and they've brought in false witnesses, they're paying them, and they can see these witnesses don't agree with their testimony, but what they really want is Jesus to be condemned. So it doesn't really matter that they're having to discard a bunch of witnesses. Eventually, the high priest just stands up and says, are you the Christ? To see if Jesus, the accused's own words, can convict him. That was actually illegal according to Jewish law, but again, they already know what they want, which is Jesus to die. So they don't really worry about that. And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son coming, the right hand of the power. And then he's condemned. At about 7 a.m., probably before, because the Gospels record very early in the morning, Jesus is led over. For the Roman times, the night, which was governed by different watches of soldiers, ends at 6 a.m. and then begins the first hours of their day. So about 7 a.m., as soon as the trial, the mock trial, is finished, Jesus is being dragged over to Pilate to be sentenced, to be judged. Pilate doesn't want to have anything happen. He doesn't want this to be on his watch. His wife has told him that she's had a nightmare about Jesus being condemned by Pilate. He doesn't really have any honest motives, but he doesn't want this to be on him. When he finds out Jesus is a Galilean, he sends him to Herod. That would have probably been about 8 a.m. after a preliminary investigation, and then the sending over. Herod wants a show, he wants to see miracles, he wants to see a sign. Jesus refuses. He's not going to perform miracles, especially for Herod, because it won't help Herod believe. Herod just wants to see a show, to see delights. He's not interested in faith or in God. And Jesus is silent, because there's nothing to say to Herod's vanity. So Herod just has him sent back. Pilate's next attempt is to make everyone feel sorry for Jesus. And he thinks by having Jesus scourged that they will say, okay, well, he's been beaten up enough already. We can just let him be. The scourging is referenced in different accounts. It would have happened, as you can see in the image, all over Jesus' body. Basically, they used a small post, um, maybe about one meter high, and Jesus would have been forced, tied over it, so all of his back is bent over. And that way the whips can land on his back. You'll see a lot of the strokes that are there. And you'll also see that the whips can fall also wrapping around and hit him on his stomach and chest area. The whipping in the other image you can see goes all the way down to his legs. So basically from a little bit above his ankles all the way up to his neck, the whips are falling. Now the Romans used this type of whip in this image, which has little dumbbells because It'll be a softer metal, like lead, perhaps bone was also used. And normally they were heated up, not for the sake of being scalding, but because if they're softer, they can go through the flesh. And then after they hit that flesh, they pass through, they hit the muscle beneath. If they were just an ordinary hard metal like iron, they would have come out, and the exit wound would have been the same size as the entrance wound. Because they're softer, they hit kind of like this. When they strike the muscle, they expand, they grow wider, and then as they're pulled out, they tear out the flesh with them. So it's a bigger exit wound. And the Romans were experts in causing this kind of cruelty. There have been numbers estimated about 150 uh, impact points on the Shroud of Turin all over it. There were three dumbbell sets per whip on the flagellum, was the Roman's name for it. And this would have been done in public. Jesus would have been totally naked in the time, and again, defenseless. After the scourging, which should have been enough, they decide to crown him with thorns. The soldiers who were stationed in Jerusalem were Syrians, uh, and so they had no love for the Israelites who considered themselves superior to the Syrians. They would have used a crown of thorns probably more like the one we're seeing here than the one the band that we're used to, because Syrians followed a more Persian or Asian style of uh, king and crown, which was not like a Roman band or laurel band of leaves or a, a later a European um, coronet or tiara style. They had a more like a cap style, which of course makes it worse. If a band around Jesus's head is painful enough, imagine what a helmet will do pressed in and the Gospels record that it is beaten in with sticks. Again, I'll have the Gospel references below. 
it could have been the Spina Christi, which is like the thorns that we know. However, the pollen type on the Shroud of Turin looks more like the nettles of the picture I've attached here, which would have been much more bushier and then kind of like a, a cap where everything points in. Easier to strike in with a stick and also easier to bend around, to really wrap around Jesus' head. There's a lot of the pollen found in the upper area, of course. I can't show you pictures of pollen because it's microscopic. So all of this is happening about 9 a.m. in the morning. Jesus is also dressed in a, a Roman red cloak, and he's spat upon and insulted, as he was also with the Jewish guards of the high priests. However, now he's bleeding. If you've ever had a band-aid cover a wound, and then you tear it off too early, it starts to bleed again. That red robe over his shoulder will have had the blood and the wounds from the whipping attached to it, stick to it, as it's yanked off the bleeding will begin again. At about 11 a.m., after the different mockeries and trials, the interrogation with Pilate, where Jesus tried to bring him around, and the Pilate brushed him aside with what is truth, Jesus is sentenced. Um, the Gospel of John records that being about noon, and Jesus goes off carrying his cross. We're used to Jesus carrying the full cross over one shoulder, so we We've seen all, all of our stations of the cross show it like that. The Roman style would have been just carrying the patibulum, that's the uh, horizontal beam over his shoulders. Um, you might think that's easier because it's only half, although we're looking at about uh, 200 pounds or maybe more of wood. It's actually worse. Since Jesus' hands are tied to the patibulum, the cross beam, when he falls, he has nothing to stop him from landing face down on the ground. His hands are literally here. The weight is over his shoulder. He's already top heavy. And of course, the shoving around of the Romans and the crowd, they wouldn't have minded. This was now part of public entertainment. Not just in Jesus' time, but all the way up until beyond the 1500s, public executions were a form of entertainment. People came to see someone die. It was the R-rated action films of the day. And so the crowd is there enjoying Jesus' death, watching it happen. Apparently, according to experts on the shroud, there are little fragments of um, pebbles or gravel inside of Je the tip of Jesus' nose. So the impact would have been so great as he falls face first onto the ground that it would have driven in some tiny bits of grit. That's how hard he's falling. Jesus is helped by Simon of Cyrene, but not before the crossbeam is also in there. You see the diagonal slant on the picture has already widened the wounds on his back in that area. The wounds from the whipping have been stretched because the weight that presses down and because the crossbeam is grating and moving back and forth as he carries, as he walks. By about noon, uh, Jesus is stripped of all clothing. Again, he was put in his own clothes. That's now removed. The same thing with the robe as before. Wounds will reopen, begin to bleed again, and Jesus is crucified. From about noon to three in the afternoon, darkness descends on the land. One little boy was asked in catechism class, why did it grow dark when Jesus was crucified? And he said, because they were killing the light of the world. The nails, again, are stations of the cross, show it typically going through the palm, uh, that's not strong enough to carry the weight of a body as he hangs. The Romans would have gone down through the wrist. So if you all want to find the spot where it went down, for me the easiest part is to start with your ring finger, the finger of love, and then follow the bone all the way down to your wrist, and you'll find a small indent there as you move it. About the center of your hand is where the nail would have gone in. The Romans did this a fair bit. They knew exactly where to find it. It wouldn't have taken much of an issue. As the nail goes through, it presses all of the bones around our wrists together. It crunches them together, which creates a very kind of like a compact unity that won't let the body then drop. It also brushes past the median nerve, which is a nerve controlling all of the body, all of the arm. So from the brain's perspective, all of Jesus' arm is suffering paper cuts or on fire. 
muscles and skin are sending a message because the whole central nervous system of the arm is saying, I am being attacked. And this happens to right arm, left arm. And the same with the crucifixion, the nail passing through the feet. That same central nerve for the legs is also being attacked, savaged. And this is just the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion at noon. By about 1 p.m., uh, different things are happening as Jesus is beginning to die. One struggle that he's having is he cannot breathe. To breathe, Jesus has to pull himself all the way up. Now, there's a picture of how Jesus' the body would have hung according to the blood flow of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, in this image, we can guess, and doctors have said that it's likely that to make Jesus fit on the patibulum, the crossbeam, which was probably a kind of a, a save money, one size fits all crossbeam. They might have just pulled Jesus' arm until it dislocated so that he would fit that crossbeam. The, the scene is in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, to make that more understandable, or, or that's why that scene is there. As Jesus is hanging, he has to pull himself up to breathe because when he's all the way down, his lungs his rib cage is expanded, so he can't breathe out. He's suffocating on his own air, and that was the death of crucifixion. He can also push himself up from the legs sometimes, but he's either pulling himself up from nails through his hands or pushing himself up from nails on his feet. Either way is intense agony. And so he stops getting enough air. As the blood stops receiving fresh oxygen, it sends to the brain carbon dioxide instead of oxygen, and that creates a, a migraine. It is one of the most intense and painful experiences, like having your brain on fire. First, the arms were on fire, legs on fire with the crucifixion, and the nerves hit. Now the brain feels like it's on fire. But it also creates cramping. The whole body will begin to go through cramps as the muscles are no longer receiving the fresh oxygen necessary. The interesting part about this is we've always seen in works of art that Jesus has his hand like this, the hand of blessing, the hand of benediction. The Romans probably held down Jesus' hand as they crucified, as the nail went through his wrist. As it does that, it would paralyze these two fingers, and this thumb would have immediately jerked in if the nerve is severed or the muscles are severed to be in this position. As Jesus' death continues and the cramps begin, this is fixed, these two fingers are fixed, and these fingers are cramping and will probably end up dead in this position. There is so much in our faith that is tradition that we don't know where it comes from, like, are we sure it was Christmas on the December 25th? And yet, when you see that a piece of art mirrored for centuries like this suddenly rewinds to an explanation we didn't know about, there are surprising ways to believe in our tradition more, to say, I don't need to know exactly why so much more of our faith is based on things that were handed on word of mouth, but were true. As the asphyxiation continues, now about probably 2 p.m., there begins to be a sensation of water in the lungs um, because a fluid is being pumped in, to, the body is shutting down. Um, so Jesus now has a sensation of drowning. All of the internal organs are struggling with the lack of oxygen blood, so it'll feel like different forms of, if you want, internal cancer or burning there as well. Everything in Jesus now is hurting. Absolutely everything. And the poor heart that is beating can't keep up. A doctor who gave me the conference on which this is based, this and other conferences, he said, and yet it seems that Jesus shut down as one. The scriptures also say the same. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. And that was not the way that people who were crucified died. Um, they tended to kind of fade out with a whimper. Jesus pulls himself up and says those words and then collapses and then he's already dead. That's why the centurion says, truly this must be the Son of God. Not just because of the earthquake and the signs, but because no one dies like that. And so the doctor said that Jesus died from an immense heart attack. If you want, 
And these were his words. Jesus died because his heart broke for you and me. After Jesus' death, the wound that happens to Jesus that he doesn't feel is a wound that Mary feels. Beneath the cross, she sees the spear go through. And again, it seems strange. Why would water, blood and water, flow from Jesus' pierced heart? As we see, for example, in the Divine Mercy images. Well, if you remember there was water in the lungs, uh, as the spear would have gone through, it would have bled a little, and then it would have hit the lungs on the way to the heart. Water would have gushed out, and then it would have hit the heart, and the rest of the blood would have flowed out. And this blood flow, which was so surprising, that's why St. John, who was there, recorded it, blood and water. And then he said this is an eyewitness, because no one would believe it at the time. And yet now we can say, oh, St. John's Gospel account was that of a medical eyewitness with something that only a doctor in those times would have known, or a doctor nowadays would know. On the shroud, there's a big blood stain, but it's not in this vertical style as would have been expected because the shroud was probably, the man of the shroud, Jesus was probably washed before he was laid down. And so the bleeding then would have been from a prostrate form heading across, and then it would have kind of sealed up in the back or the blood would have gathered in the back. At Jesus' burial, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea have him taken down. Remember, Jesus dies at about 4 p.m., sorry, 3 p.m., and they have between 4 and 6 p.m. with the permission of Pilate to bury him at 6 p.m. It's already another day in Jewish time, and that's a Sabbath day, and they can't be outside, they can't be walking uh, because of the limited number of steps, because there's work that you can't do. So they have about two hours only to bury Jesus. There is pollen and images on the shroud that indicate he was probably uh, buried with different flowers next to him, and yet it would have been a, a scrappy, a quick burial. Um, a funeral was done too fast, which is why Mary Magdalene and the other woman want to go back on the first day of the week, on our Easter Sunday, to give Jesus a proper honoring, to properly anoint him. They weren't able to do that all of the Sabbath day. These flowers are typical to the region. It's also strange that some of the pollens on the Shroud of Turin are from the first century and from the area of Palestine. Uh, flowers that come in, they bloom in uh, March and April in this region, so, uh, and are now extinct. And then we come to the mystery of the Shroud itself. There's almost no pigment on the shroud, apparently, all of the little points of what would be coloring on the shroud would add up to one teaspoon. Not only that, there's other things that are unexplainable, as in you can't see the shroud from close up. If you were painting it from the distance you are to your computer or your phone, you wouldn't see anything. You'd have to paint it at about three to four meters of distance. And you have to paint it at that distance with one teaspoon of pigmentation. How can you do it? It's a kind of iron oxide. The only explanation that uh, scientists who believe in the Shroud have is that the image was sealed in there by a burst of light. And that's what we celebrate in Easter. We celebrate Christ's light bursting through, and that light, almost like a controlled or conscious nuclear bomb, radiates and blasts an image into the Shroud. And Jesus leaves for our Easter. Jesus' life continues. He has left the shroud behind, which is what also surprised John and Peter that the grave robbers in the time would leave the body, which was worthless, the corpse, and they would take the clothes with them. And yet, the shroud is left rolled up and the body is not there. Jesus left the shroud for us, maybe to help our faith, and I hope this helps us to see the passion of Christ and also to look upon the one who was pierced for our sake, and to be mindful of him this Good Friday. I hope it helps you go hour by hour living the passion of Jesus and growing in love for him. May God bless you.